Registry Matters is an independent production. The opinions and ideas here are that of the hosts and do not reflect the opinions of any other organization. If you have a problem with these thoughts, FYP. Recording live from FYP Studios located in our super secret underground bump bunker somewhere on the eastern seaboard, this is episode 81 of Registry Matters. Larry, this is weird because last time we recorded it was Friday and now it's Saturday afternoon. The sun is out. Um, there are birds chirping. I'm not at home. This is very confusing and disorienting to me. How are you? Well, I'm in a great location where we have beautiful acoustics, beautiful weather, and we're going to have an abbreviated session of Registry Matters, hopefully an hour or less. <laughs> I have us uh, slotted exactly at an hour. Um, can we, uh, can we uh, go back and reflect on the conference real quick? Real quick. So we, uh, we had that live recording, and I cannot believe that we had to call in uh, the Houston Police Department to, to provide crowd control. There was a line around the building. It, it was chaos. We had all kinds of groupies running around. It was nuts. It, it was shocking, wasn't it? It was amazing. It was very, very humbling to it how many people came up and said hi, and they appreciate the podcast and listen to it and all that. We even, we even had even people who couldn't see us that said hi to us. That's correct. Um. I guess we should just uh, we should just start running out because we are under a tight time schedule. First thing that uh, happened though is we got an email message. I don't know if it was after the last episode or the one before, but someone commented that uh, Facebook is a private company, and uh, and you know they offered that the Facebook the uh, stock symbol is FP, FB, and I guess it was uh, us talking something along the lines of a, uh, a a a public entity versus a privately held company or a publicly traded company. Do you want to clarify things there? I think it would be in reaction to to a comment I made that said uh, Facebook is a private company, and and literally, if if in the context, you, when we say when I said private company, what I meant was not not in the same context. When we have public utilities that are that are owned by the city of whatever you pick your choice, uh, the 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 city of Atlanta Water Authority, or the city of Atlanta Sanitation, or whatever. What I was referring to is that Facebook is in private equity. The the investors own Facebook. There's no governmental unless some of the government pension funds around the country have invested in shares, but it's owned by shareholders. And and those shareholders have one one motivation, which is to earn a profit. And that's what management's responsibility is to the shareholders. Management does not have a responsibility to society as a whole. Now, some ideal world that we might create in our head, uh, uh, corporations would have such an obligation, and some take their corporate responsibility very seriously. But, but when I said that, I meant that, that Facebook is, in fact, owned by shareholders that are out in, in the country. I don't know their current shareholder count, but it is a private company, meaning that the government does not have any ownership interest in it or any managerial control over, over Facebook. And can you reflect real quick on how that impacts the First Amendment, which is a constant uh, claim of uh, suppression of freedom of speech? Well, it, it, it would be if, if, if Facebook were owned by the government, then the claim would be, would be very strong because that would be a government interference. When, when Facebook doesn't allow people on its, on its network, it's Facebook shareholders that are keeping people out. And of course, there would be a shareholder revolt if the shareholders were saying, we, we, we're going to dump our shares on the market. If you don't, all of a sudden, uh, management would probably reconsider. But since there's no governmental regulation, the, 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 this, the, the, the First Amendment, the, that protection is to pre- prevent government from, from suppressing speech. And there's no government suppression there. This is Facebook's management at the encouragement of government, but there's no government regulation requiring them to do it. Facebook could open up their entire network tomorrow to everybody. If they wanted to, hmm. okay. I think I know that we've uh, covered that pretty much at length in the past, and it still comes up as an issue. And the uh, other, go ahead. The, well, they were, they were, they they were more open to to everyone at one time, but they received a lot of pressure from the public. the The general public is is in opposition to people being allowed to troll on social media where minors congregate. Un, un, without any any uh, restrictions, they they have a problem with that, and so the, so that's that's how this comes about. When when the public no longer has a problem with it, Facebook will no longer have a problem with it. Hmm. All right. Um. And then I I don't um. So we we've made comments recently about uh, libraries and um attending and being in the presence of a library and 
to some degree, our people are pushing back and saying, I can't be at a library. I've been told I can't be at a library. And this comment came from someone off of the website, uh, emailed it to me. And they said, uh, an offender shall not loiter within 500 feet of property line or any property which there is a school, child care facility, playground, park, athletic field, or facilities, school bus stop, college, or university, or any other business or facilities having a principal purpose of caring for, educating, or entertaining minors. That is some garbage legalese, Larry. And then uh, additionally, it says in DeKalb County, Alabama, will charge a sex, f- sex offender for being 500 feet or at a library, which isn't really the best of grammar. And I didn't quite gather how they wanted that worded. Please, please clarify how this is set up. Well, I appreciate the, 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 they said the statute. I have not researched the statute other than just having the citation there. But pay careful attention to the wording. It says an offender shall not loiter. It does not say an offender shall not be present. So the question becomes, what does loiter mean under Alabama both case law and in the definitions of, of SORNA, wherever this, wherever this is, is contained, where this restriction is, they generally have a definition section. So in, in, in the Sex Offender Registration Act of Alabama, they would say, loiter means this. Well, I will argue that, that a person who's at a library conducting research is not loitering. Loiter is generally, uh, to, to loiter, one is aimlessly hanging out. Well, there's, that, that's not an aimless, uh, having a meeting at a library in a controlled environment, in a, in a community room, where the doors are closed, except for the people who are participating in the meeting, that is by no means loitering. As, as far as what the Black's Law Dictionary, what the general uh, people would understand loiter to mean. But I am not going to say that, 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 that they're not being told that. As we say, they can do it until they're stopped. I, I take them at his word. The DeKalb County, Alabama sheriff may be telling them that if you're, if you're present in a library, we're going to lock you up. They may very well be saying that. I have no reason to doubt it. And you, what the way we would resolve this is you'd say, well, you're going to have to lock away, and we're going to find out in court whether I'm loitering when I'm on when I'm at the library doing a term paper or whatever people do at libraries these days. I know that I don't use libraries very much, but uh, everything is online practically. But whatever people do at libraries, you say this is this is not loitering, and you'd have to file a motion, hopefully under 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 uh, Alabama rules, to dismiss the case because it doesn't meet. When a, when a complaint is invalid on its face, you say the judge, you should dismiss this complaint because even if everything that's contained in the complaint is factually true, I was at the library working on my laptop and th- 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 they, th- that, that we can see is true, but that is not loitering. Judge dismissed this. We won't know until someone challenges that. But as far as my understanding of loitering, if I read that literally, and I would follow the Scalia model of reading it literally, it says loitering. So we have to look and see what, how loiter is defined. And if loiter is defined as wandering aimlessly with no legitimate purpose, then clearly you have a legitimate purpose if you're attending a meeting that's been organized in a controlled environment. So that would not qualify as loitering. But I can't guarantee you that the sheriff wouldn't tell you that it does. I can guarantee you this, that it would be one hell of a fight if someone wanted to make it. You mean one hell of a fight as in it would be easy for us to win? I don't know if I could say easy. I could say it would be one hell of a good fight because... There's case law out there from the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals that sex offenders cannot be banned from libraries. And so I'm, I'm in the check cashing business these days, and I would love for, for, for to have that fight. So if the person can provide documentation specifically to what the instructions are by the DeKalb County Sheriff, and we can see that in writing, perhaps maybe we can reach out to that person on the Narsal's uh, organization from the Narsal organization, and perhaps we can find a plaintiff that would like to be the test case, and maybe we can cash a check from DeKalb County, Alabama, because you can't just ban sex offenders from the library. Now, let's qualify that. If you're under supervision, meaning that you're reporting to a probation or parole or community supervision officer, you have a diminished expectation of liberty and they can impose additional restraints on you. And it might be that a person who's under supervision would have a very weak case because of the nature of their individual characteristics. But just a blanket ban for people, for, for people going to a library, I'd like to have fun with that. Hmm. All right. So perhaps we can go to a library, but not necessarily depending on further circumstances. But still, it, it it just feels like, I mean, if you're going to go to their children's reading hour, that's probably a bad idea. 
But to say that you can't go to get tax forms, because that's where tax forms are often distributed, how would you get them? You can't necessarily, some people can't necessarily go online. It just feels like that's the natural place to go get uh, information about your community in general. Well, I would, I would think so. Of course, the last time they put tax forms in the library was probably <laughs> 15 years ago at, at, at least. But, but a, a library, a library cannot just look at the ACLU versus City of Albuquerque. We've had this battle. The Tenth Circuit is not binding in Georgia or Alabama because they're in the Eleventh. But it would be one heck of a persuasive case if they're telling people that they cannot be on the premises of a library. We've already had this battle, and it's already been won. Well, let's move on to the hot news item of the week. We have uh, something coming out of Alaska in the last, uh, I don't know, just in the last handful of days. Can you give us a quick teaser, and we'll cover it at the end of the show? Well, it's it's a decision regarding out-of-state person who had been convicted in Virginia and had moved to Alaska 15, 16 years ago. I think it said 2003. And uh, he has been uh, persistent, and this is the state Supreme Court uh, dealing, uh, addressing his claim that, that he's entitled to due process, and they agreed with him. And we'll, we'll try to cover it with a little more detail, but honestly, I've just read it today, and I've done a brief, brief uh, read, so uh, we, we won't be as detailed as I'd like to be. Oh, what a shame. It's almost like you don't have a computer with you when you travel. Who carries a computer with them when they travel? Uh, probably not the person that carries a shower head. Well, everybody carries a shower head. Uh, did you not see the survey results when we did the hundreds and hundreds of people live recording? Well, I didn't see as many hands go up as I thought I would. <laughs> did you expect one? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I did. I did get a comment, and forgive me for this one. But one of our listeners says, "I can relate to Larry. I always carry a bidet with me." Carry what? A bidet. Oh, okay. He has a he has a portable uh, tushy squirter. Uh, so, well, <laughs> well, uh, I I can't I can't imagine that I'm the only one that carries a shower head. I thought that was common common luggage for everybody. Absolutely, as as you you got firsthand knowledge of everyone that's hands went up and said that they carry shower stuff with them. You 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 do owe me a picture of that, don't you? Did you get that? I don't believe I did, but, oh. but but I but I have it with me. We can make one here. Oh, okay, good, 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 good. Then uh, then I will. I have evidence to support the claim. Yes. Ah, and in chat it says "bidet" to you, good sir. Good day. There we go. So it's a, a play on "good day." Well, let's uh, let's let's knock out these articles. You're under a tight time schedule, and the oh. fir- the first one comes. Uh, I guess that's actually from that particular thing. We have a. Uh, they're they're trying to move the people from. In Miami, the ones that got moved out of the, the, like the industrial park. And then they found, I think, sort of like an incognito hidden under a bridge or something or another. And they're at it again. They are forcing these people to move. And what was striking to me in this article, Larry, is that there's an individual that says that we will help them find housing. We just need the city to give us a place that would be, you know, within, you know, far enough away from all these things and we can minister to them, we can help them get their stuff straight. And Ron Book is out there saying, I I mean, hey, it's a great idea, but nobody wants to help. And it feels like he is literally setting up roadblocks while under the guise that he has his charity group, whatever, that's supposed to help out. And uh it, it these people are just getting shuffled around, shuffled around, shuffled around with no place to go and living in deplorable conditions. Well, if I'm not mistaken, he is the head of the homeless trust that's supposed to, that's its primary mission is to, uh, is to resolve the, or you, you never resolve homelessness altogether. Right. You deeply, significantly ameliorate the, the, the homelessness. But uh, he's, he's the head of the, of the homeless trust in, in Miami Dade County. It says, uh, there's a quote in there from him. It says, taking significant funds to fund the building or the renovation. You know, that re- remains to be seen as to willingness to do that. Well, if he's in charge of it, then, I mean, at least he has a vote, to, uh, uh, depending on if, you know, if they have a whole committee on how many people would vote for it. I, I just think that whole thing is just a front to give him some sort of cover to, to, to push our people into these terrible conditions, but then he's the the head of this homeless trust thing, even though he never has any intentions on using that money to help anybody. That's well, how I feel. 
Yeah, I don't know if I can say he doesn't have any intent, but I can know. I know through the years I've heard it. He, he says this 2,500 residency restriction is a good thing. Maybe it should be. Uh, I heard him say it should be tweaked. Maybe it should be 1,750 or or 2,250. <laughs> but he's convinced that it's a great thing, and he says it's a no-brainer. I've heard him say that that it's a no-brainer having the that, that these people should not be around. And I don't know. I don't know how we the, politically you can't repeal this once it's on the books. And if the courts, if the courts are not going to strike it down, and I, again, I don't know what challenges are being uh, underway or what are being considered in Florida, but if they can't strike the 2,500 feet, which is two and a half times the state, which is a thousand feet, which doesn't even apply to all of the, of the offenders, but if they can't do anything about the 2,500 feet, it's going to make it very difficult to solve homeless because you're in Miami Dade County is, a, a, is an urban area, right? It's a concrete jungle, so to speak. Yeah, and you, you, you don't have a lot of open land where you can – and, of course, you don't want to put homeless people out in the middle of nowhere because they need services. And if you put them out in the middle of nowhere, you really can't deal with their issues because they need to be where services are. It, it, coming back to the conference, it wasn't just said once or twice, but multiple, multiple times that there's a mountain of evidence that says – these residency restrictions increases homelessness, increases the odds of recidivism, but we still have the political suicide that repealing these or making it some degree more accessible is the politically popular thing to do. Repealing them is the political. I'm sorry. I'm, I mean, I, like to, to to keep them in place. I'm sorry. I did word that backwards. Um, but to keep them in place is political. To to repeal them is political suicide. It's politically popular to keep them in place. Uh, and I think I think Iowa was able to was able to recognize the the, the counterproductive effects of, of the re- residence restrictions and and there was but it's going to require a coalition. This is one of the things where you do need uh, where you do need do need that famous bipartisanship because it's suicidal to put yourself in risk to to, to take this stance if you don't have law enforcement buying, you don't have DAs buying, you don't have you don't have full buying from everybody. Because then you have insulation, and right right now to try to to lead the charge to repeal the twenty five hundred feet would be potentially suicidal. This uh, to I, I think when Australia uh, did their gun collection stuff, I think that was in the nineties. I think every politician got voted out that next cycle. This almost feels like it would have to be something like that. Like the whole group of uh, legislators would get voted in, do that one thing, knowing that they're all going to get canned on the next cycle. But just to do something that is beneficial to obviously an unpopular group of people. So, or or you or you strike it down to judicially prohibited enforcement, and that's been a tough tough thing. The court challenges have, have there's been a mixed bag on residence restrictions. We talk about the Louisville case out of Texas where it went all the way to the Fifth Circuit. And they didn't find a problem with about ninety seven percent, ninety eight percent of the city being off limits. Uh, so so, uh, but barring that going through a political process is, is, is very difficult. That's why it's so important to stop things before they're put on the books. And that was a message that Paul Dubling was talking about. Was it educate, legislate, litigate, I guess, and not necessarily in that order? Yes. Well, well, uh, sitting back behind the keyboard and hoping that something doesn't pass, and, and monitoring is the first step, and, and I, I, get, I, I chide people for monitoring. I say monitoring is a step that's necessary in the legislative process. If you're not aware of it, and not monitoring it, you certainly can't take action. But monitoring by itself, just watching something progress through the process and be passed and signed into law, monitoring is only a step in the process. The the the, the more important part is having an action plan and where you're going to intervene and and, and, and what, who you're going to go to as it moves through the process. If it gets passed, you have all these various checkpoints where you're trying to, to derail something, depending on if it's a city council or county commission or state legislative body. And you have to have a plan of what you're going to do next if if plan if your first component of your plan, I have I have various kill points all along the way that I'm looking to kill something, and who I'm going to go to next if I fail, and who I'm going to go to next if I fail, and and without a strategy, watching is very is of very little use, just monitoring. But but people do that, and that is the first step. But even even from the the challenging of the judicial side, thinking about like Packingham, they're turning right around and coming back and trying to introduce a new law to to do something similar. It's even worse potentially, but yes, there. The, oh, really? Stops, yes, nothing stops the legislature from legislating. Right. Courts cannot prohibit legislation. 
So if they if they have a version that's unconstitutional, that doesn't mean they can come back they they can come back and try it again. And in fact, it doesn't prevent them from reenacting the same law. Now, of course, the judge if the court would find it so problematic, if it's the exact same law, you should be able to get that. Uh, uh, it, you should be able to get that enjoined very quickly. But they can make some slight, slight tweaks and come back with another law, which is what they're doing in North Carolina. And they're just declaring everybody who has an offense against a person under 18 to be a serious violent offender. And then they're going to uh, 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 apply that restriction to all those people. Well, that's uh, if you take all the Internet solicitation cases, and all, all, you would, all you would really exclude would be possibly, possibly indecent exposure because all the child porn cases, I think, would be, 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 be that's considered a victim uh, that's a minor. So you would have very few people who would not be subject to the newly enacted ban. So you're right back where you started from. Mm, 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 mm. Well, since we're short on time, let's move on to an article from CBS Pittsburgh. State police warn a phone scam targeting sex offenders. Uh, and, you know, at some point in time, we'll be able to get an individual that's close to the podcast to, to talk about his personal experience with this. But here it is again, where... Uh, various phone calls come in trying to tell you that you have to go down to some local office and, and donate, contribute a whole bunch of money to keep you from being arrested for miscellaneous things. This is more of a PSA, a public service announcement more than anything, but just wanted to bring it up again. It keeps, it keeps surfacing and, 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 and it's the, the, the phone scams are just enormous. They, they target on the fender, sex offender re- registries around the country, they target people who are not registered. A, a good friend of mine uh, received this about a year ago. She 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 has a warrant out for her, and she la- we laugh about it. We're waiting for her to be arrested. <laughs> but but uh, the, the, the IRS phony investigators are calling people that that they're that uh, I got one from the Social Security, the Deputy Commissioner of Social Security, since I've been in Georgia. Wow. The Deputy com- my my account is being used for fraudulent purposes, and they're going to arrest me. And and, and uh, it's important that I call that number back. Well, of course, I have no intention of calling the number back, but but I did answer the incoming call, and it was one of those automated. This is the deputy commissioner of Social Security, and and the offenders uh, are so intimidated. If you've ever gone through the registration process in most states, I can't speak for the pure wind driven Vermont where you have to uh, give them a form, uh, but but. Uh, <laughs> But but for for most states it's a very very intimidating and painful process, not physically but emotionally painful process to go through, to 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 have all these guns around you and have these people treating you the way they do and fingerprinting you and you sit in dark rooms sometimes waiting to be processed and, and this is it's, so anything that's going to cause a person to fear that they're going to have to deal with the consequences which are possibly years in prison, I believe in Oklahoma it's a five year mandatory prison sentence uh, if you violate the terms of the uh, Registration Act. They, they, it, it's it's easier for a person to fall. I mean, we can laugh about the, I, the the Deputy Commissioner of Social Security calling me. I can laugh about that because all Social Security would do would be to issue me a new number if my if my number had been compromised. They they would they would notify me that the number was being suspended and they would not call me or anything like that. But but people people in this situation don't don't for some reason that is just the emotion is so overpowering that they that they respond at the moment and, and try to, to take care of the problem. And there is no problem. The only problem is there's a scamster out there. Is there any uh, is there anything that we could do collectively to try for, forget stopping responding to them? But is there this is a scam? I mean, this is fraud. This this seems like it's criminal. Well, it is. How would we proceed to push back and actually like? I mean, I don't know how you would get in touch with these people. I don't know how you would find out who it is. Well, that's the whole problem. That even with the vast resources of the federal uh, investigators, oftentimes these people operate offshore, and you're the more the techie guru than I am in terms of how they can avoid detection through various spoofing technologies that are in use. And, and it, they're difficult to to track down. They do occasionally catch them, and they put them in federal federal prisons when they do. But the payoff is enormous. It only takes one person. If you're getting three or four, five thousand dollars a yeah. clip, it only takes one person. You've made your day's pay, and then some. If you get one person uh, through your automated uh, barrage of phone calls, if you get one a day, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And it says at the end. I wonder if you'll uh, say if this is lip service or not. It says, "Police say anyone who receives those calls should give the state police Megan's Law section the phone number and other information about the caller." Do you think that they would even attempt? Would they lift a finger to try and uh, resolve this? I would like to put on my rose-colored glasses and believe that they, <laughs> that, 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 that they would. Uh, 
the police are going to be like any other group of human beings. There are going to be people there that say they deserve it. But right. I would like to believe that even the majority of the police, it, it, it's an intrusion on them. I mean, they, 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 it, it, it's when you're, when you're impersonating law enforcement officers, they generally take that seriously. And these are people impersonating law enforcement. So I would like to think that the majority of, of that is sincere, that they would like to prosecute these people. Mm-mm-mm. This one is, uh, this next one, it, this is coming from the NBCBayArea.com uh, website. It says, student uses Snapchat gender switch filter to nab, uh, ah, shoot, my screen's cut off, uh, but nab cops allegedly looking to hook up with teen girl. Uh, that is worded incredibly terribly. But what someone is doing, so there's a filter on Snapchat that lets you take your appearance and flip you into the opposite sex. And then they're going online and posing as that opposite sex person and claiming to be underage or close to it and, you know, basically doing like the sexting stuff, but they are uh, not not law enforcement. And, you know, who's the victim when it's a law enforcement officer that's 40 years old that is getting you to come out and visit them? Who's the victim there? Who's the victim here as well? But this could turn into vigilanteism and all kinds of nasty stuff to go along with it. Now, now remember, I'm 80. Oh, actually, a bit, eight, way 800 more. 800 is 800. what you are. I'm, I'm, I go back to Lincoln. Explain to me exactly what. So you, you change your gender. Yes. In appearance. Like it is a picture of you, but then, you know, if you're a guy, so then we'll soften the features. We'll put some makeup on. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a picture on the website of an, an Asian and forgive me if I'm not using the right term and anybody gets offended. And then the next picture has long hair. It's an attractive Asian female. And then you send that picture around and try and entice some people to say that, you know, Hey, you want to hook up, but you're not a, who you say you are. And you're completely misrepresenting to try and entrap someone to come out and, and visit you to commit some sort of illegal act. And now you've, uh, I mean, we, you know, uh, what was it? Nine months ago, we covered an article of a guy that's actually doing this, but you know, they get pictures from someone else, and they're 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 claiming to be someone else, and then they're going and beating the crap out of people or calling the police, like right there on the spot, just doing like civilian vigilanteism policing, and that's what this is. They're just using their face and then using technology, just like a, a voice changer thing. But this changes your uh, your picture. So the, and this was uh, I glanced at the article. Uh, this was a cop who wanted to hook up with with the uh, regendered individual who was posing as a minor, correct? Yeah. Well, what's the problem with that? <laughs> well, well, what's the problem? I mean, it, it, I'm sure the cop will say that it was not a real person, so therefore it was an impossibility that he was uh, he was not hooking up with a minor. So his defense would be that I haven't done anything wrong. It was a fantasy. Right. Um, it feels, uh, yeah, but I, I, there's, there's sinister motivation here of, of tricking someone into something to shame them, to do other not speakable things to them on the backside as well. I, I, I wish this were, weren't happening. I don't know what the answer is to it. Uh, well, I, I don't mean, know if you, did you see the news in the last week or so? Uh, there was a, they're calling it deep fake. There was a video, I believe of Elizabeth Warren where it was not things that she had said, but they had they had released a video on Facebook, and um, and then there was another one released of Mark Zuckerberg, and it is not anything that they have said, and they they capture enough video and they capture enough audio to comp- you know script something, and it it feels fairly natural of what they're saying, and it is entirely false. Did you see that? I did not. Oh my god. We are headed into a very bizarre era where, you know, with as much uh, evidence, and I don't mean evidence in, the, in like a criminal case, but, you know, you have all these recordings, you have all these videos, you could dump that into a computer and then you write your little script and it will balance and, and enunciate all of the, the things to, to, to make a video of, of you, Larry, saying something that you support all of these other things that you've never, ever, ever said. And hey, but we have a video of it. How do you dispute it? It would be incredibly hard to dispute a video. Well, how do how do they make that though? Well, just with computer software. You know, I mean, you know, we've had speech synth- synthesis forever. If you remember back in the late seventies, early eighties, there was speak and spell. You type in the letters, and it would go, "You have spelled school." And you know, it sounds incredibly mechanical, but now they have it to the point where it's very fluid, 
add on a video component to where the face matches with the way lips move and all that stuff, you have something of a very, very, very close facsimile of someone in real life speaking something that was never, ever said. I guess the uh, the law is going to have to evolve in some way to keep up with the technology. I, I'm almost inclined to say that, you know, I know we, we talk about eyewitness accounts and how flawed they are. You almost come back to that, that where you see this video of Mark Zuckerberg saying these things, but you would have a cameraman in there most likely. And, you know, can you get enough people to say, yes, I was there, I saw this thing, and and have them be unimpeachable that they're telling the truth. I, we're running into an era where there's going to be more digital, uh, fake kind of things to get people in trouble than, than we're going to know what to do with. And, and the, 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 the law will be years and years behind in terms Absolutely. of trying to remedy that. Yeah, and uh, somebody in chat said there's a clip of Joe Rogan. He has the biggest podcast on the internet. I hear he makes like $9 million a year doing his podcast. We're close. We are a close second. Uh, and uh, the listener says that he had no idea it wasn't him. It was a very, very, very clean copy of him saying what he didn't say. <laughs> so, and he was convinced he said it, although he knew he didn't say it. I, and, and, you know, you know, turn that around to where if if you keep repeating that the person has said it and, you know, the New York Times is fake news. How many times do you hear that before you end up saying, oh, yeah, the New York Times, that's fake news? And then you just eventually believe it and it just becomes part of your lexicon. Absolutely. Well, I, I, a few times on the podcast, I've, I've, I've said that about stuff that have become historical for folklore that aren't true. You know, <laughs> un- unemployment went through the roof under Jimmy Carter, except it didn't. You know, it actually went down, but it's been repeated so many times. Exactly. That, it, that, it, that it's become the truth of the given. But uh, unfortunately, it's just not true. 11 million jobs are created in those four years, but it supposedly went through the roof. <laughs> I, I understand. And but, so then if, if, if enough social networking stuff, if enough search engine marketing stuff goes into place to support the lie, to have the attributes to it and the sources and the sightings and all that, it's almost impossible to refute what is truth and, and, and argue against the lie because you have so much evidence behind it. I, I don't, I don't know what the solution is to that. So I don't either. All right. Well, Thank on that you. note, that there's your good news for the week. And, the, and, and super duper short, but it's Cuba Gooding Jr. Brian Singer answer Me Too claims. Gooding is expected to surrender to New York police today following allegations that he groped a woman in a Manhattan bar last weekend. The Oscar winner said he has trust in the system. That'll be the first thing I want to ask you about. And claims there's a video of the incident that will prove his innocence. And I, I just brought this up because here, you know, maybe he did it, maybe he didn't, but he is going to turn himself in and he's going to trust the system. And I'm kind of, and actually it's kind of ironic that he's standing in front of a banner that says Weinstein company. There's a certain amount of irony right there. Um, do you have trust in the system that they'll treat him fairly? Uh, my trust in the system is, has, has suffered some significant, uh, erosion through the years. I, I have, I have, uh, trust in the system that that he if he has the resources may get treated fairly but still with the resources he may not be treated fairly because of all the all the the things that have been done that make it impossible to defend a person adequately i'm going to go with a cuba gooding jr has uh, has a couple bucks that is correct but if he's not allowed to do these things but people people talk about things that 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 attorneys ought to do and, and, and many of those things are not allowed to do, you know, the, the, with the shield laws and, 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 and the restrictions on cross examination. We can't, we can't go there. So you can have all the money you want, oh. but, you, but you, you're not allowed to do the things because the victims' advocates are constantly restricting what can be done because it's re-victimizing a person to actually put them under cross examination and confront them. And it's, it's not re-victimizing them. Our system is an adversarial system where that the accusing side bears the burden, whether it be in a civil and a criminal or a criminal case. But somehow we've allowed ourselves to be convinced that that cross-examining a person and looking at motive and looking at prior actions is somehow victimization. It's not. It's the way the system is supposed to be in, in, in a confrontational system. That's the way it's supposed to be. He has a net worth of $24 million. Is that enough resources? That should be a reasonable amount that he could... <laughs> 
but 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 if you're not allowed to employ those resources, if you know, it's like the uh, the, the no, well, nobody's gonna remember this uh, high-profile case of Wayne Williams and the Atlanta child murders back in the uh, early '80s, and uh, he had to jam up defense team. But but uh, 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 later on, one of the defense attorneys, uh, there was one from Mississippi named Alvin Binder, and there was a, a local attorney from she had been the city solicitor named Mary Welcome, and they, they went. They said we could have defended our client a whole lot better if we'd have been allowed to, but we were ineffective because we weren't allowed to be effective. Uh, they were determined to, to to convict someone for those child murders, and and uh, and, and, and the the process. They allowed evidence that should. We had all this fiber evidence, and I'm talking like former district attorney Lewis Slayton did. We had these fibers and this carpet that they took out of Mr. Williams' home. It had the fibers similar to fibers that were found on the victims. So therefore, <laughs> that made him guilty. Because well, how many people had those same fibers? Uh, I can imagine a lot, actually. And and, and, uh, and and so Wayne Williams still maintains his innocence to this day. I don't know; have no way of knowing that he, if he's innocent or not. But he was supposedly dumping bodies. He 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 drove over the Chattahoochee, one of the Chattahoochee bridges, which is a, 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 a an infamous river around around these parts, and. Supposedly, while he was driving, they were staking out uh, uh, rivers because they had found some bodies in rivers, and he was able to drive and hunk a male body over the bridge and never leave the car. <laughs> and That's they a heard, good trick. What do you do, heard, just toss him out the window? They heard, Yeah, they heard the splash, and they went and pulled over Mr. Williams because he had been on the bridge. And they they knew he was the one who threw them. And I'm and I'm I'm this is nearly forty years ago, so I'm going to have some of these details wrong, but I do remember the fibers. And I remember that that, that uh, they were not allowed to be effective in zealously defending the accused because we had 28, 29, 30 young men that had had had, had been killed, and the, the city was on the verge of, of of eruption and violence. And at that time, there was the fear that the killer would turn out to be white. Well, Mr. Williams was not white; he was he was black. But there was all the I mean, the city was 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 really in a lot of stress for all this period of time that these young young men had been had been vanishing and, and turning up dead. If you're not allowed to be effective, you can't be effective. And the uh, victim, victim's advocates are making sure that the defense can't do their job. certainly does feel a little uh, challenging to try and do what you're not allowed to do. Uh, let's, so let's, uh, let's hit this uh, Scalia clip. The false notion that committee reports and floor speeches are worthwhile aids in statutory construction. Close quote. Mr. Justice Scalia, you have no interest. How much time do we have? You have no interest (laughs) in probing the intent of a legislature. We are, as as the famous line from the Massachusetts Constitution says, a government of laws, not of men. We are governed by the laws that Congress enacts, not by the unexpressed intent of whoever wrote them. And if they meant up when they said down, that's their problem. I frankly, if the legislative history is utterly clear about that, too bad. Uh, We're governed by the laws. So that's point one. You you shouldn't be worried about their intent. Anyway, you should be worried about what what was promulgated to the people. That's what they're governed by. But secondly, even if you were interested in legislative intent, Are you going to find that in legislative history? For one thing, uh, in in a multi-member body, it's very hard to understand what the intent was beyond the words that they all voted on. Other than that, they could have voted for them for very different reasons. Uh, Just because one or two of them say, oh, I think the language does this, the rest may not have felt the same way. So the notion that you can pluck statements from a couple of legislators or even from a committee report, which is usually written by some teenagers and, and, uh, <laughs> and not even... Members of the Federal Society, if we're lucky. Not, yeah. Not even, not even, not even, very often not even read by the committee, much less read by the whole House, much less less read by the other House. Uh, the, the, the notion that that somehow is reflective of the intent of the whole Congress and of the president who had to sign the thing. I mean, it, it truly is the, is the, last, uh, the last surviving fiction in, America, in American law. There would be a lot of fictions, you know. This is a fiction. It, it's, uh, you have to, 
engage in a, a willing suspension of disbelief to uh, to accept <laughs> this. I, I'm I'm kind of halfway becoming a Scalia fan. Well, the reason why I'm doing this these segments is to let people know the, that sometimes what they think they're for, they're not. Well, Scalia's telling you, you better get the words right. And my judicial doctrine, I don't care what the words say. If that's what's on there, and, and those words are, are we're not going to, we're not going to second guess what they might have meant. We're not going to look at floor speeches. We're not going to look at committee reports. We're not going to look at anything other than the words. And if the word says that if you're living in Colorado and you're required to register and you move to Nebraska, we don't give a rat's you know what about about intent because those are the words and that's what we interpret. We're a nation of laws. We're governed by laws. And that's what the law said. And if you don't like that law, you need to change that law. And that serves you well in some cases, and it doesn't serve you so well in other cases. In other cases, when 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 you would like a little bit broader interpretation, because you think and you're convinced that that's not what they intended to do, but it was the result of sloppy drafting and incomplete debate, and that that no one intended that result. And when you when you get an unintended result, you say clearly the court should have saved us from that. No, the courts, according to Scalia, should not save you from unintended results. You should save yourself by doing the job right to start with, or going back and changing it. I'm I'm trying to 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 come up with ideas of you know, you know extreme things. So, like Scalia a couple of weeks ago said that uh, um, capital punishment is not unconstitutional. Then, if a state makes a law saying that something is or is not allowed. And someone tries to bring challenge to it, if if it doesn't pass any sort of test of it being constitutional, unconstitutional, depending on what the issue is, I I feel that if it is not listed in the Constitution, then you should just be allowed to do whatever you want to do, short of it not being listed there. Did well, I confuse you in that, that the way I worded that? That that's 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 uh, an argument that people make that if it's not prohibited, it's it's permitted. But all of a sudden, they deviate from that when it comes to things that they don't like. There's no prohibition anywhere against abortion. Right. So they should be permitted. <laughs> Fair. Uh, we, we, but I mean, on that one, and I don't want to dredge up that thing, but you say it's an invented right. Well, it's an invented right because there was no nobody when they drafted the Constitution, and I'm a supporter of a woman's right to choose, but no one drafted the Constitution and said, oh, okay, we've got to make sure that we're, we're drafting this, that anybody who desires to abort babies has that right. They, 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 did, they, did, they never conceived of that, just like Scalia is correct about the death penalty. When they were drafting that cruel and unusual punishment clause, no one was thinking about that is a cruel and unusual punishment. It was widely accepted at the time. It was widely accepted at the time that abortions were not legal at the time when they drafted the Constitution. They would never have drafted something in their mind that would have allowed abortions to take place. And, and whatever crude abortions were done back in, in, in colonial yeah, times, no doubt. They, 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 they never were thinking about permitting those to happen. So it's, it's something that has evolved because the Constitution doesn't provide for it. No one was thinking about it at that time. Now, like I say, I support it, so I don't need any emails saying I support, <laughs> I support a woman's right to choose. But I do believe within that right to choose, when we've kind of digressed from, from yeah, registry yeah, yeah. matters, I do believe that there is a point where you have life, and I don't know where that point is. It's certainly not the ninth month of the pregnancy upon delivery. You certainly have life. That That is a life at that point. But where that life, where, where you define that as life, you could have a... You could never agree on that because some people believe it's a conception, and they're not evil because they believe that. Some people believe it's after three months. That's where you got the, the first trimester uh, the, the doctrine, and then after the first trimester, it becomes more problematic. And then these states, particularly in the South, are going after it six weeks after detection of a heartbeat. Well, you wouldn't have been able to detect that a heartbeat back at, 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 right. uh, not that many years ago. I mean, I don't know how many years we've been able to detect a heartbeat, but, but you wouldn't have been able to detect a heartbeat in, 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 a, in a developing fetus. So... But, we'll, we'll translate transfer that over to like internet usage and you know the evolving technology. I mean, obviously, you know, seventeen eighty whatever, eight, you know, early eighteen hundreds. The internet wasn't even a, a glimmer in anybody's eye. How do you then square what someone says is a constitutional right, not right, when you have the two different camps saying 
something uh, has to be actually enumerated in the Constitution as a right versus some sort of evolving mindset of the doctrine. Well, now, let's be clear. Scalia doesn't say it has to be in the Constitution. He says that people, the states, can make their own regulations when it comes to to, to, to these things. Uh, that, that the states can can have their own uh, limitations on abortion, and he, and he's he he doesn't say that he he says he takes no position on the death penalty. You'd have a death penalty if you want it. You can pro- prohibit it if you want to, but don't claim the Constitution prohibits the death penalty because the Constitution cannot be relied upon, in his opinion, as as cruel and unusual punishment. Now he says within that death penalty you can have arguments about what would be the the proper way. You could have a process that would be cruel and unusual in executing someone. And there again he left it open for 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 how what 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 method might be cruel and unusual. But just the mere act of putting the person to death is not unconstitutional. Well, as the, as we have evolved with technology, he says we use the same methods. We look at what the what the Constitution does. It, 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 you're, you're, you're safe and secure in your home from 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 the government intrusion without due process, without probable cause, no no search, no unreasonable search and seizure. You can't have your. He believes that all that stuff still applies today. You can apply it to the new technology, but you would look at what the, what what the what the founders were intended to prohibit, which was 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 overreach of the government. <laughs> and, and individual liberty. The, the the individuals need to decide what they want as far as as in the Scalia's model. If you want, if you want, he says, get your fellow citizens behind you and pass a law. Get your fellow citizens with you and sell your ideas and pass a law. And then, from a constitutional point, the law is considered constitutional until someone challenges it and proves it's not. And they have to show by the clearest of proof. It's it, it they they they. They afford great deference to to the to the work of the people, and we'll have clips on that as we go because Scalia says they they put their hand on the on the uh, the same oath that we do as judges, so therefore we afford them as uh, the the lawmakers the respect that they sworn the same oath and they have the same dedication that we do, so we're we're going to give great deference from the judicial side. That is those are his words, and like I said, we'll we'll be having clips from him from uh, for for a long time to come. There's so much out there. And and some of what will you hear from him, you'll agree with. Some of it will sound good until you dissect it. In terms of, <laughs> in, in terms of what he says about his interpretation, if it ain't there, he won't save a bad statute by 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 putting something in it that's not there. His doctrine is it if it's if it if it's if it's void for vagueness, we won't we won't fix it. That's that's not our job. If it's void and and it, and, it, and, and the statutes of, uh, should should collapse. Other judges believe that they can that they can do an error and, uh, uh, and they can insert words that are not there and 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 you can imply meaning that's not there. And Scalia's doctrine is it is it we don't do that. But but don't expect him to save you from a poorly written law if you don't like the outcome because if the if it's not unconstitutional he's going to say well I, I don't necessarily agree with this it's not the best thing to do but they can do it until, until the people no longer want to do it. If you don't want your young men registering in Nebraska, you if you people in Nebraska need to pass a law. Of course, you failed this session, but you need to pass a law that changes that. Right, right. All right. Well, that's enough of Scalia for the day. And before we head out of here, so we're going to spend five or six or something minutes and talking about this new Alaska Supreme Court says law requiring all sex offenders to register is unconstitutional. The first article that I have comes from the Washington Examiner. There's, there'll be another one in the show notes to go with it if you want to do some further reading. Um, tell us what's going on here. Well, this one's going to be one where I'll, I'll, when I get back home, I'll highlight. There's, it's, a, it's a great read for the legal beagles. You, you're going to enjoy it uh, because there's so much in here. Uh, it's 40, 40 some odd pages. There's a dissenting opinion, forty nine pages, and there's a dissenting opinion. But, but what what the legal junkies will really like is uh, starting on page seventeen. They they say that they're applying strict scrutiny, and they explain the various levels of scrutiny. So on 17, you can see strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, and rational basis. So the, uh, that that helps explain that. And then and then on page 24, something that I've said for years that it's finally finally beginning to resonate with the courts because the arguments have been made. In Connecticut Department of Public Safety versus Doe, when they said it was okay to put put the internet registration online, they said 
it is it is okay simply because all it does is place conviction information out there which is already public well they were right essentially in 2003 that's all it did at that time but i tell people when you have that kind of good dicta at an old decision you use it to your advantage and you say yes that is correct if you merely were to disseminate their conviction information and boy, do I get people mad when I say this. <laughs> if, they, if they just simply took your likeness, your photograph on the day of conviction, and they listed your offense, and they said, congratulations, you're now registered, and this will follow you for the rest of your life. We've put you on a list, and your name will never come off of it. That might withstand any type of challenge because it's long been accepted that, that, your, that your record is public, unless, it's, unless the, the state provides for an expungement or, or a shielding or a sealing. So that, well, that's not what's, as, as the second and third generation registries have come around, that's not all that happens. So if you look on page 24, they mention that the state argues that a sex offender lacks reasonable expectation, expectation of privacy and registry information because the fact of a sex offender's conviction is a matter of public record and that it places, and that his places of residence employment are not of a sensitive nature. We do not accept these arguments. As to the first challenge publication here, it is not a public court file that shows a conviction, but rather the internet publication of both the conviction and the personal information in a compilation of sex offenders. Second, an offender's address and employment information when included in such uh, a compilation is sensitive information because the, the, its publication can lead to serious negative consequences. This is not public information, boys and girls. Your conviction is, but where you're working is not. That was not a part of your conviction. What you're driving is not a part of the conviction. What you look like 30 years later is not a part of the conviction. And those arguments, for some reason, attorneys have been intimidated to make those arguments. And when, they, when they're when they made, they work. You can say, yes, the Supreme Court and, 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 and Connecticut got it right. They were right. That was essentially all that's being re released at that time. But that's distinguishable from what happens today. They put, put practically everything about you on the internet uh, th these days. The, the registry filed, the, there's a few exclusions. I don't think they'll put your social security number, but they practically put everything else. Yeah, certainly. And many states publish where you work, where you live, what you drive, the license plate number. That's not a part of the conviction file of the permanent record that that, that is clearly releasable. Tell, tell, and, go back to that. You brought up uh, publishing your social security number. I, you know, couldn't we go in there and and put poison pills in there, or something like that, when these legislation, these ideas come up, and say, "Well, sure, why don't you put the social security number on there?" and get someone on our opposing side to go, "Well, no, we don't want to go that far." Well, how far do you want to go? Isn't having all that other information almost equivalent to having your social security number? Because once you have that, then you could get all of the keys to the castle. It, well, I don't know. What would we gain from advocating that? Just just to, to push it to the extreme to try and get someone to see the irrationality of the other items being posted? Poss possibly. But this, this, this decision is fantastic in one regard, and that's that it, it, it certainly illuminates some of the arguments that I've unsuccessfully made, but also it's not so good because... If you look through, and I didn't have a highlighter here, but if you look through there, they they very much say, toward the end of, of the majority opinion, they very much are cognizant that if they were to declare it unconstitutional and let it go dark, that would not be, they're, they're concerned about the public safety benefit. And so therefore, they did the same thing the New Hampshire Supreme Court did back in 2015, which they cite that case. They decide to create a, a, a due process from judicial fiat rather than that than just under the Scalia model. If Scalia were to get to this point that where they are at, he would simply say the thing falls. It's their problem at this point. If you enact if you act enacted an unconstitutional law, that's your problem when it when it's no longer able to be enforced. So rather than taking that approach, they create they say a sex offender is entitled to have a due process hearing where he can show that he is not dangerous. Now, everybody, before you go ballistic, that's what he argued for. 
if you read the opinion, he argued that he should be allowed to show that he isn't dangerous. So this is not something that they invented. This is what he argued for below. So they merely bought in his argument that he that he should be entitled to show that he's not dangerous. So they're, they're, they said that he could either do it within this case or he could file a civil action and, and show that he's not dangerous. And uh, But how, how is this going to work? There is no process. So everybody who's got an out-of-state conviction in Alaska, you have to follow. You have to file something that doesn't exist. You don't know what to style the action on the on the pleading. You don't know. Well, I, I, I guess you would call it a petition for due process hearing for out-of-state registrant. When you take it into the court clerk's office, because you're not going to be able to use the drop-down menu on the electronic filing, because there's not going to be a drop-down for such a pleading. So you take it into the court, and the, the court clerk's going to say, "Let me see my supervisor. How do I file this? What category does this go under?" Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like, I, I don't know how they're going to deal with how the mechanics of these processes and who's going to pay for them. Uh, the, the sex offender has got to go hire an attorney in all likelihood because he or she's not going to be able to know what to file because the attorneys are not going to do it either, except they'll get paid to try to figure it out. And, and these people are entitled to a process. We don't know what the burden. He's got to show he's not dangerous. By what burden? Is it by clearing convincing? Is it by... By what level of evidence? Is it by uh, a, a, a preponderance? Is it by uh, more like less likely? I mean, this is this is this is a this is an example of judicial activism. On them saying it's unconstitutional, and them and them creating an, uh, a, 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 by ju- judicially creating a process that doesn't exist. I got you. I got you. So they they establish these extra little. Uh, tidbits to go along with it where it's totally not their place. They can either say they can thumb up or thumb down, but not do the other things. That's my, my position. I, I, if, if, if you want to, to strike the thing as being unconstitutional as applied to an out of state registrant, you simply strike it as being unconstitutional as applied to an out of state registrant. You do a stay for 90 days or, or 180 days, I don't know when, how, how long they're in session up there, and you say that this decision will become final after 180 days and the registry will no longer be enforceable. Or anybody convicted of out of state, and let the let the people in Alaska figure out what to do about it. I see. Hmm. And, uh, but but they've created this imaginary process that doesn't exist, and it'll probably help this guy because if he's been fighting this for 16 years, he's not going to give up. Wow. So, so he's going to go get his hearing one way or the other, and, and, and probably prevail. But but in terms of the widespread, I would not uncork the champagne. I would not <laughs> pronounce the end of the registry because of this. Is it a good decision? Yes. Is it a step in the right direction? Yes, absolutely. I did notice in there that they said, uh, uh, again, I haven't marked it, but they, were, they said that, that the majority of the states have risk-based systems. I, th- I was not aware of that, and I consider myself somewhat informed. But they, they say in here that, that the majority of the states are providing some, some uh, level of, of – of, uh, and I just didn't know that. I, I'm wondering then, do you think if that's actually a true statement? Well, they have they have this this thing is loaded with footnotes. There's well over a hundred footnotes, and they have a footnote for it. Um, okay, it says one such. This is on page thirty-five. One such decision is Doe versus Attorney General. Uh, well, no, that's about the about about a Massachusetts, Massachusetts case. But but they but they say that uh, that the majority of the states are providing uh, a risk base, and I, I did not know that. Um, you you don't register in Georgia. Uh, I mean, they do have the the assessment board where they do where they do level you, but doesn't change your registration obligations, does it? Uh, if you're level three, I think you get lifetime. I believe. Hey, uh, uh, there's a comment in chat says, "How does a person prove a negative? How do I prove that I'm not dangerous?" That comes from Will. Well, that's no. How come? Uh, ask him how come Doe argued that because that's what he asked for. All right, and what's the answer then? I don't know. I mean, he the, the 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 person who brought the case argued that he should be allowed to prove that he isn't dangerous. So oh, why did why did he argue that? Okay. If 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 it can't be done, why did he ask that as as one of the the, the relief that he wanted? Yeah, I mean, you know, to to we we all assume that we as citizens are not dangerous, but put us under some level of circumstances, and any of us are dangerous. So does that make all of us dangerous or none of us dangerous? So, well, I don't know. And uh, I, th- I think we got we to gotta close the show out so you can uh, head and take care of your business for the afternoon. 
Well, I, I would I would like to make a closing comment about. Oh, please, please, uh, we, please, we, please. We had we had a fantastic meeting here in Georgia. What we did? We did. We had a meeting at a public library where where there was a good turnout, and uh, Georgia is going to be on uh, on the rise. Uh, and we had we had some great people show up that have have skills that can be uh, very positive moving forward on the legislative and, and legal front. And, uh, and we, f- I, we found a doppelganger for you. A what? A doppelganger. What is that? A doppelganger is a person like you, you, you're almost looking in the mirror and, and not that, not that the person physically necessarily looks like you, but he, like he is active in the legislature. He knows where the front door is. He knows the processes. He knows the people and he is on top of things. He's a sharp cat. He de- definitely is, and and I was uh, I was so excited that we we got to meet him, and uh, he's going to be a fantastic asset. And as I was in the meeting, I said something that you reacted to that I didn't realize anyone had reacted to, but but you did. And, well, and, I don't know uh, if anybody else did. I just uh, heard it that way because I yeah. look for him. Yeah, I was I was talking about the deference to law enforcement, and and as as a as a as a liberal versus a conservative. There tends to be, as a general rule, there tends to be a conservative will, will be more deferential to what law enforcement claims they need. And we had a podcast guest who were talking about the border, and he said, well, clearly they need the wall and because the Border Patrol says that they need it. And just de facto, that, that if, if law enforcement says something, and I made a comment that that as, as these we were talking about how legislation is born and how it moves through the process, and that law enforcement, the law enforcement establishment, the apparatus, as I call it, generates for these things. And a conservative, we're talking about in the legislative context, a conservative legislator is going to be predisposed to bend towards the will of law enforcement and defer to their judgment until such time as, as they have been educated and shown that law enforcement will ask for things that they really shouldn't have. And I wasn't implying that the conservatives were not educated. Generally, I was I, I, I was implying and saying that that there's the, the nature of a conservative when it comes to law enforcement is to say, by golly, if they say they need it, they need it. And that was that was the only point I was making. We we tend to, uh, a person who's more liberal who lived in a in, in a in a more diverse community and been exposed to more poverty and more 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 issues with crime. And seeing more police abuse and overreach, they're going to be a lot more skeptical when the law enforcement says we need more power, we need more, we need more of this. Somebody like a Senator Rick Sorley in New Mexico is going to say, "No, the cops doesn't need that. They don't need that. Yeah, you know, we're we're not going to do that." Such but, as uh, armored personnel carriers in Greene County, North Carolina. Well, I'm sure they need them, but 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 law enforcement typically gets a lot of benefit of doubt and. And they get it across the board, but particularly from conservatives, because that's what's standing between us and them. And people see it as an us as them, and they're the good guys, and they're going to give the good guys what the good guys need. And I don't see it quite that way, because I, I see I see a lot of abuses. I mean, we just have to listen to the emails we get about people having their homes invaded by what I refer to as the Gestapo units. So they come out with all this massive manpower. That they've tied up and they intimidate people into coming and searching their homes. Uh, I don't want to defer to law enforcement because they do do things they shouldn't be doing, and they they do take take advantage of people's rights. And they are the good guys, but they still do good guys do things that are not so good sometimes. Don't we need that to keep the community safe, though? Well, uh, I, I suppose that's one way of looking at it, but. I was I was talking I was talking to to Brenda today and I uh, before we did the podcast and I said you know it's funny how the perception you know this is actually the best time to be alive if you're living today in 2019 this is the best time you could ever be alive I would not want to go back to the 1970s driving the clunkers that were made in the 1960s I wouldn't want I mean we have a device we carry all of us carry that that'll do so much for us we, from navigation to planning our, 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 our meals and, and we can stay in com- constant communication. We can talk across the country for free. We're using this platform. It's not costing us a dime. Uh, the average American's affluence today compared to the 1950s and 60s and 70s, I mean, we're so affluent as a society. Crime has been, been reduced to a level that we haven't seen in our lifetime. How do you in know terms- that that number's true? Well, it, I mean, <laughs> it's like I, I- I'm baiting you to say where you got it. Well, well, I, I, 
I know it's true because I I look around me and I don't see, I see a sensational case on the news, but I see a lot fewer crimes. As people, when my brothers told me yesterday, he says, well, I, I've got to have a big wallet because somebody can pick my pocket. I said, well, you're 64 years old. Can you Can you tell me how many times your pocket's been picked? He said, never. I said, well, okay. Most of your friends are in their 60s. Can you tell me who has who said their pocket picked? He said, nobody. And I said, so you're, you're trying to get a big wallet that won't come out of your pocket easy. And and we've got hundreds of years of life experience, and you can't cite a, a single example of a pocket. Okay, okay. Well, he says, well, people breaking in. People. I said, well, has your house been broken in? No. Do you know anybody whose house has been broken into? No. So you've got hundreds of years of friendships with people, and nobody's house has been broken into. And it's like, it's like this this is the best time to be alive but yet we're so negative about about our plight and we have we have so much to be excited about to be alive today and yet it's it's such negativity and and he's just a basket case of negativity about how bad things are yes things can get better we we need to we need to work on improving some things where we're not doing so well and particularly in terms of distribution of of of, of income We've got massive amounts of suffering out there in this country of plenty. You were in Houston. What did you see that you didn't see? Oh, my see? God, dude. It was incredible. Every underpass, when you, the, the interstate goes over all these little cross streets, and under every one of them, there's a condominium complex of people living in tents under every freaking one of them. It was really atrocious. Well, and, and then in, in, in my hometown of Covington, there, there's, there's this, uh, there was a there was a, a, a service shelter of some type that they've closed, uh, but but there's this lady that that uh, is on a, a main thoroughfare with a shopping cart and with a tent, and 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 my brother says she's always there, and I said she has nowhere to go. Where would you like her to go? Right, right. <laughs> he says, well, she should go. So I said, where? Yeah. She has no home to go to. There's no shelter here. Where do you want her to go? Of course, she's out there. When she goes to a, to, to a business and she camps out on the sidewalk to try to panhandle, they tell her to leave, yeah. to get off their property. So she's out on the side of the road with, with a shopping cart, with a tent, and you say, well, she, she's always there. Yes, she's always there because she has nowhere to go. And, and we, have, we have millions of those across this country, and, and, and that, that's, that's one of the things we've got to do better. We've got to figure out how to provide people with the basics of life and and uh, but so we don't have a perfect society but it sure is a good time to be alive absolutely all right so back to go to visit web, registrymatters.co if you want to check out the podcast there you can also subscribe uh, to email alerts when the new episode comes out we did get a whole bunch of new people after the uh the conference uh signing up that way and larry of course i know you know the phone number what's the phone number well that's a great phone number it's like 747 747- Two two seven four four seven seven, and then how can people sh- send us an email message? Registers matters cast at gmail, and then of course always the best way to support the podcast. And at what level should people contribute? Well, I have not had any takers, so I'm just going to say any levels beginning at a dollar a month. <laughs> they're, they're, no one, no one has given their gross or net paycheck yet. And then, uh, and where do they go to do that? Uh, that would be registry matters co. No, no, no. That's patreon.com slash registry matters. Oh, that would be Patreon. Uh, yes, Patreon. So. And uh, I think that'll pretty much shut us down because you've got to get on the road. And uh, as always, Larry, I very much appreciate it. Thank you to people in chat for hanging out with us for a little while. And this isn't as short as we were expecting. And uh, we'll talk to you in a week. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for joining us here at FYP. And we hope you will join us again on our next broadcast.